Thank you so much. I'm going to do uh, three things, really. Um, talk about curriculum, talk about succession planning and retention and recruitment, which I think, having spoken to several head teacher conferences recently, that's the main issue at the moment um, for, for lots of people. And also about the latest book, the SCND Hub book that I've just published with Mary Meyer. So the first one, I just want to go briefly, talk briefly about my thinking at the moment around curriculum conversations. Begin by saying that I was a, I don't expect anybody to know who the hell I am, but I, I live in this Twitter bubble where I have um, a ridiculous number of followers and um, for some reason uh, get invited to talk to people like, like you and, I, and I'm really very, very grateful. But I, I taught for 33 years. I was going to be, I was a head teacher for 18, four years at Lady Lumley's up in Pickering in deepest North Yorkshire where it is still 1953. Um, <laughs> And I arrived there as a, uh, then, back in the day, as a 38-year-old head, um, which was very young back in the day. And uh, you can imagine what that was like, a, uh, someone who turned up in Devis, North Yorkshire, uh, 38 years old, wearing pink shirts from Brighton. It was not easy, but um, I, had a, I had a good, good grounding then. Then for the last 14 years of my career, I was a head teacher at Huntington School in York, um, one of the leading first research schools, and we did lots of lovely work there with people like um, Alex Quigley, uh, Rob Coe, Stuart Kime, people, um, uh, Becky Allen, did some really lovely stuff about improving quality of teaching and learning. And then I was going to um, carry on for a bit longer, but uh, in, you know, as we just came out of lockdown in July 2020, and the sunshine was still around, those, those, those first 10 weeks of, of weird, weird 10 weeks, I got a letter saying that I needed a new battery for my pacemaker. I've had a pacemaker since I was 43. And um, if you've never heard me talk about it, pacemaker operations are really interesting because you're completely awake. Um, when I had my first visit in 43, and people who've lived in York will know that York is not just a village, it's a hamlet. Um, the nurse holding my hand when I had the first operation was a year 11 mum, so we discussed her daughter's A-level choices <laughs> while the bloke rummaged around in my chest fitting my pacemaker. Um, but I was really looking forward to the second one, turned up, there was a sheet under my, under, over my head at this time, um, so I couldn't always look at, the, at what was going on. Um, but I could hear the bloke going, bugger, and crikey. And I thought he was actually going to put his knee on my chest. He just couldn't get the thing out. The box, had, you know, all the fibroids had grown around the box. And, uh, and then I said, Nigel, what's wrong? And he said, I'm, I'm trying not to puncture your lung, but if I do, you're in the best place. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, why are your legs flapping? And I said, because I can't stop them. And literally under that sheet, I thought, enough. Uh, absolutely enough, um, that I would do something else. So I, so, so I ended quite early. Um, and also what I could see coming up was, was the, I was going to be the same age as my dad was when he died. And what I didn't realise um, when my dad died at 57 was that he felt like he was 24, like I do. You know, and ha you know, how did it get so late so soon? There's a great book by, by one of Jeff's protégés, I imagine, Oliver Berkman, um, and Oliver Berkman's from, Hunt Jeff was, was head of English at Huntington. Oliver Berkman used to write for The Guardian, great writer, great thinker. Um, he's one of our ex-students, and I got, I've got to know him a little bit too. And his dad, Steve Berkman, still on the governing, was on the governing body for a long time at Huntington. And he wrote a brilliant book, if you've not read it, called 4,000 Weeks. The number of weeks you get if you live to your 80. Now, if I live to 80, I've had 3,000 of my 4,000 weeks. Right, it's only, what, what day were you, Thursday, morning, Thursday afternoon? Right, so there's only, there's only 4,000 Thursday afternoons, right? So what I say better be good, right? Because this is one of your 4,000 if you live to 80. Um, it's just a sobering moment when you think, actually, I've got a little bit left. I'm going to make some decent choices about what I do. Which brings me on to, to why I do. So, so what I'm trying to do at the moment is just is talk to people and hand over the baton um, with some humility. And one of, the, one of the books I'm going to talk about is Putting Staff First, um, book I published recently, relatively recently with, with John Yutley. And John Yutley was my head of sick form. He's now um, a, a, a CEO of a trust in the East Riding and do, doing great things from an ethical point of view. And I just wanted to hand the baton on to Johnny. Um, but I do enjoy doing this work. And, um, um, and one of the things I do feel like, I feel like I'm a bit of a grandparent, what it must be like to be a grandparent, where you do all the nice stuff in the day and then hand the baby back in the evening to be 
be fed and put to bed and nappies changed. It's a bit like that with schools. I come in and do lots of lovely stuff, but I don't have any responsibility for them in the end, and I feel a bit of a cheat. And, and I, was, I don't know if you heard uh, Isabella Lende on the radio the other day. She was brilliant, and she was talking about being 80 but still writing. And people say to her, I thought you'd retired. This is what she said. I haven't retired. I've just retired from everything I don't like doing, <laughs> which I really liked. Um, and there's a sense of that. And the other day, I had a real, real reminder of it when I was asked to go and do some work in a school and felt myself being crunched between an SLT and a faculty leader team that were at loggerheads with each other. And I was just caught in the middle. Um, and it reminded me of the tough stuff that you do. So I do stand here with utter humility um, about what you do. You're still doing the job, you're still leading schools. If I can just make you think a little bit this afternoon and be useful, and um, that's my main thing is to be useful for you, um, then that would be great. So you can have you know, as much as I can throw at you, anything you want from what I show you this afternoon, you can have. Um, so I started this work thinking about curriculum with Mary Myatt. Um, we've just published the fourth book, the, the fourth huh book. Um, I'll tell you a bit, I, I don't assume you know anything about those books, but um, they've been pretty popular. Um, the fourth one was published two weeks ago tomorrow, and last, a week last Saturday, it was number 51 on the Amazon charts, and Stephen King was number 53. So it's my, my publishing, the zenith of my publishing career. Um, but it's been, it's been really popular, and it started, the first book there, which is it was the Key Stage 3 book, started um, when I emailed Mary Meyer in on the 21st of February, 2021, I said, Mary, I've got an idea for a book. Um, I've line managed over 30 years as a senior leader. I've line managed probably every department. Um, we've never talked about the curriculum. All we've talked about is meaningless data that we've made up, which is you know, largely what we did at Key Stage 3, if you didn't know, make up that, lots of that data, um, and then had conversations about it. As long as there was a positive plus sign in front of the data we presented to governors, everybody was happy, and we just connived in, in that kind of stuff that was all a bit nonsense, really. Um, but I never talked about the curriculum. So the title, I said, Mayor, I've got this book. The, the, the working title of the book is The Middle Leader's Guide to the Curriculum for Senior Leaders so that when we discuss our subject, they know what the hell they're talking about. Right, and I was line managing modern languages at Huntington. I, well, I got a CSE grade one in 1980 in German, 43 years ago. I was line managing someone um, who had a double first from Cambridge in German and Russian. I was a chocolate teapot in terms of how useful I was in discussing the curriculum because I couldn't offer anything up about the curriculum and I couldn't challenge anything in a constructive way about what she told me. I just had to accept the whole thing. Um, was, you know, and I thought that, was, that, that's, that can't be right. So I had this idea. We interviewed 19 subject leaders and two senior leaders um, and we ended up with a with a book that's been really popular. And as I was talking about that book at Eton in the summer of 2021, um, we, we, it was six months from start to finish writing the book. I was in, uh, in the audience with um, Philip accordingly, and she said, um, we need a primary version of this. So we interviewed about 30 or 40 primary practitioners in the autumn and came up with the green book and the blue book. Um, and the green book is the, each subject. And the blue book is everything else about the primary curriculum that, that is much more complex than you might think about how you get a rotor for teacher for timetabling um, mixed age classes for each subject, all that kind of stuff. And then um, the final bit that came out a couple of weeks ago is the SEND, huh, where we interviewed 30 people about um, experts about SEND. Really interesting, really sensitive. I learned tons about SEND. And I feel ashamed that I didn't know about it before. I feel ashamed that I was 18 years as a head and I didn't, my understanding was so clearly minimal compared to what it should have been. So I, I've learned most from the SEND conversations. So some brilliant people. And then um, I've got 35 people who want to contribute to the alternative provision home. We, we begin those interviews in September. And the whole rationale for doing these books is just to give a platform to people who are doing great work who you never hear of, right? People like me, for some reason, I have this platform. I have worked hard at it, but I have this, I'm, I have this privileged platform for, uh, for discussing stuff and promoting stuff. Um, and I now, in, in the very latter stages of my career, I want to give other people that platform because there are people doing great work out there in the corners of, of our country uh, that are just 
utterly brilliant. So that's, that's the rationale for it. I, I've, I've seen a lot of teaching recently, and, I, and I'd, I'd be really interested to find out what you think about what's going on in schools. But that's Michael Young, if you didn't know about it. And Michael Young wrote a book in 2014 called Future Schools, and it came from exactly the right place. It was about a knowledge-rich curriculum for social justice. It came from every, a place that every one of us could subscribe to, that we do this work so that people, children from, from on our toughest estates, the most deprived children in this country, have the same education and the same access to the knowledge and understanding and skills that people like Boris Johnson get when they're at Eton. Why shouldn't they? Absolutely from the right place. But last September, Michael Young wrote this. If you haven't encouraged people to engage in the process of acquiring knowledge, which is a very difficult process, then all you get is memorization and reproduction in tests. The current interest in the curriculum overlooks this point. It's so concerned with saying, have we got the knowledge, that it forgets to ask, how is the knowledge being acquired? And I think that's a really, really interesting quote. Because um, I think what I see, uh, you can tell me different, but what I see, and especially in Key Stage 4 classes around the country, is lots of attritional lessons, where no one's really having much fun. Right? We're just grinding through the thing. There's so much content to cover. The curriculum's so overburdened, so overloaded. Um, teachers are under incre in increasing pressure, and we think as long as we give them the stuff, as long as we give them the knowledge, that I, I've done my bit. And I don't know if it's part of post-COVIDness, whether we, we were so in a place where we didn't know who was going to be in the lesson the next day, we didn't know if we were going to be in the lesson the next day, we were all teaching from behind the line, just give them stuff. I had a record of how many bits of paper were stuck in one exercise book. And it was 24. But the other day, and I've, I've got it in my notebook, and sometimes I use, I've, I've used a slide re this week. But last week, I was in a lesson, and I just sat with a, with a child, and he'd, he'd got his, his exercise book there. And I counted up. And as I wrote 81 pieces of paper in my notebook, the teacher handed out another one. So I crossed out 81 and put 82. Right? The child had no idea. And not, they'd not learned anything about what was in the exercise book, but they'd got lots of stuff in the exercise book. It's, it's phenomenal what's going on. I was in a school yesterday, and it was stunning. These, these books, that, you know, we asked for, for a load of books to look at, and the children come and talk to us about it, and they've got lovely books, full of stuck, stuff stuck in. And you're make, what, that, what teachers are doing is are making really rubbish booklets. Right? That's essentially what you're doing. And you're paying the glue company a lot of money for making rubbish booklets. Right? And I said to this lad, in, and the, clearly these were hand-picked, and I said, so geography then, what's latitude and longitude? He said, is it the equator? Right? So I had no idea what he'd got in the, in the book, and he was the best there was. Right? So, so something's going on, because we're not actually thinking about how children learn. We're just giving them stuff, is my, is my, is my notion. And I think there's a, there's a few things going on. I'd love you to go back and have a think about that. I'd love you to go back and see how much glue is being used in your schools. Right? And, and then test, to ask the children about what they understand about the stuff they've got stuck in. So Dylan wrote in, a year ago, we interviewed, I've got to know Dylan a little bit, we interviewed Dylan, Mary and I, um, a few months back. I've interviewed him a few times recently, actually. Um, and he... I, asked, I wanted to look at his, his booklet he wrote, Principled Curriculum Design 2013, a decade on. What's it like, Dylan? What do you think of it? Does it still hold up? Do those principles still hold up? And he, said, Dear, he says this in that, in that booklet, neither the intended curriculum nor the implemented curriculum is the real curriculum. A great intended curriculum, badly taught, is likely to be a much worse experience for young people than a bad intended curriculum, well taught. Pedagogy trumps curriculum, or to be more precise, because the real curriculum, sometimes called the enacted or achieved curriculum, is the lived daily experience of young people in classrooms. Curriculum is pedagogy. And what I've seen is that we need, to, what, I'm, what I'm sure about is that we need to go back and think harder about how we teach and how we assess, not just what we teach. We've spent so long in the last few years talking about what we want children to learn, that we've not thought about how, we've not engaged them in being part of a learning community, that they really love this stuff for the sake of it. Right? I, I have studiously, we have both studiously avoided each other 
in our career, my, my, my wife and I. We, you know, she teaches at Fulford School in York, School of the Decade in the North. I'm sorry about you know, all the Bradford schools and everything, Nick, but you know, it was, it, Fulford was, was, was Sunday Times School of the Decade. And my wife teaches there, brilliant teacher to A level of, of history, and uh, history and politics. And uh, I've stayed away. But I went in a room the other day, first time for ages in a classroom. And a classroom's an absolute treasure trove of stuff on the walls. Forget your cognitive overload rubbish, right? Display, just she loves to display. And it's, it's, clearly, she teaches to A-level. She still has a dressing up rail. She said, when I get bored, and it's a Wednesday afternoon in November, and I've got year eight, and it's the princess is in the tower, I said, should we dress up? And they go, yeah, it'd be great. And there's, there's a, there's a, she said, there's a red feather boa over there that year 13 boys die for, right? <laughs> they, they will fight over who wears them, right? And they absolutely love her, and her results are great. And she doesn't have any of this BS. She knows how to teach, right? So we've got to be really careful about being so prescriptive. And, I, you know, the bit I'm going to talk about is about... Um, is about recruitment and retention, but we've got to, we've got to, find, some of the, we've got to find some of the joy back of, of teaching. Um, so it's three bits. It's content, it's, it's adaptive teaching, and it's assessment, and it's the relationship between the three. I want to talk about these really... I usually do a much longer talk about this, but I just want to get you thinking about this when you go back to your schools. Um, so the first thing is just about what should we learn. We know it's a quart into a pint pot. It's the only picture of a quart into a pint pot I could find. But it's, we're just kind of cramming stuff in. Primary curriculum. It's just so full. Right? So if you just had, by the end of primary, tell me what you think of this, but end of primary, a good grasp of the number system, the four operations, fractions, decimals, and place value, secondary could do the rest. Right? If they just were really secure on that. Why are you doing geometry in year three? I know why you're doing it. It's because the government say you've got to do it. But actually, you know, it's a, it's, you know, Estonia is the new Sweden, we know, or the new Finland. But you know, with a, with, a, with a mass curriculum that's about a quarter the size of ours, they do just as well in national league tables. Right? So you've got, to be really, you've got to think really hard about how we get the whole thing done. So when we interviewed Dylan a year ago, Mary said to him, what do you say to people who say there's too much, too much in the curriculum? And he, he was really interested. He said, well, you've you got to think about the need to know and the need to know. Every unit, the need to know and the need to know. Um, and the need to know is the stuff that children absolutely fundamentally have to know. And then the need to know is the stuff, the icing on the cake, the stuff that it would be neat if they knew it, but it's not essential. So I was working in a school last week and we, we talk, I was really pushing subject leaders about the need to know and the need to know. And this brilliant subject leader said to me, look, I've got this history unit on slavery. And he told me what each lesson was. There's 10 lessons there. I can't get rid of any of them. They're all essential. And I said, OK, lesson four, life as an, life as, life as an African slave in the USA. <coughs> Is that need to know or need to know? Could I actually apply all my knowledge and understanding and address the questions that are going to come in the GCSE without knowing that little bit? And when I pressed him on it, he admitted, yeah, it probably could. I said, well, that's neat, that's, that's neat to know. Neat to know that, but it's not essential. It's not essential knowledge for that unit. And it was like they were kind of, you could just see the scars falling from his eyes. And we get so hung up on stuff that we, we get so protective about our curriculum because we've always taught that. That actually asking hard questions about what you should what you should um, what you should cover in any unit works. So if you have, then let's say you've got a five lesson unit on respiration or year three magnets. Let's do year three magnets, five, five science hours in, in year three magnets. About halfway through the fourth hour, you decide whether the need to know has been learnt. And you have all sorts of different assessments going on. You have your radar on, you're noticing children. And then at the end of the fourth, lesson, fourth hour, you think, yeah, they've got the need to know, as well as I need them to have it now. In the fifth lesson, we're going to look at the way that they use um, magnets to stop sharks attacking fishing nets, because it, it mucks about with their, their sensory system. We're going to watch this really great video on the National Geographic, and then we're going to explore whether we've got our own um, humans have our own magnetic field forces. Wouldn't that be fascinating for those year threes? How great. Or you think, no, they've not got the need to know. Where, they're not where I want them to be. In the last hour of the five hours, 
you reteach the need to know to make sure they've got the need to know. That's just being really adaptive, really thinking hard about it. And I've got some, there's some lovely stuff I've done with a, with a school up in Grimsby, Tolbar Academy, with a lad called Liam, who's a, an RE teacher, head of RE, and he's constructed his key stage three curriculum exactly around the need to know and the need to know. And you can see where he makes a decision in the, in the, in the overall planning about what they do next. It's beautiful. And Dylan really liked it. He thought it was a great example of, of getting something that's kind of slightly theoretical into, uh, into real practice, creating flexibility in your curriculum as adaptive teachers to go one way or the other. Really lovely stuff. Um, so I usually go on a lot more about that. I read, reread recently um, Jerome Bruner's um, process, um, process, The Process of Education. He published it in 1960. Um, and in 1977, he republished it with an intro. And his intro was great. And he said, if there's one thing he's learned, it's this. A curriculum is more for teachers than it is for pupils. If a curriculum cannot change, move, perturb, inform teachers, it will have no effect on those whom they teach. It must be, first and foremost, a curriculum for teachers. If it has any effect on pupils, it will have it by virtue of having an effect on teachers. And if you think about the things you've loved teaching that have gone absolutely brilliantly, that's because you've loved it too, right? When I started Media Studies A-Level in 1998 with Carl Alwell <laughs> up at Huntington, um, we were so into it. It was, it was dreadful, really. We were so into it. It was, it was amazing. Every, every, every gangster movie notes page for each gangster movie had a water, watermark of the original movie poster, right? That's how mad I was about it. And we met this lad not long ago who was in that first cohort of A-level students. And he said, the thing is, Tomo, you and others, you, uh, you were so into it, we had no choice. <laughs> you were so into it, we had no choice. And there is something in it, you know, Chris Such says, even if, you, even if it's the 100th time you've taught this stuff, fake it, fake enthusiasm. Because if you're not enthusiastic, what chance have the children got? So there's a little bit there, bit about adaptive teaching. I, 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 also, I, would, I would go back and ask your, ask your staff, have we got an agreed understanding of what learning is and how learning happens? Because I, I, I didn't have one for a long, long time. Right? I, and the best, I've just, I've, I've just for, the first, for the first time in four months, um, I scheduled a blog to be posted today. So I've just posted a blog about the, the micro of, of improving teaching. Um, and I think the, you know, the, my best definition of, of learning is a, is a, long, a, lot, a permanent change to, to long-term memory. Permanent change to your long-term memory. Really easy to exemplify. We used to have a, a woman at our place called Lucy Lawrence, who's deputy. She was great, very trendy. Um, went off to be a head teacher. I think she's head teacher now in Cambridge. And um, when she left, we bought her as an SLT a really gorgeous um, vintage school satchel. But the but the stitching was completely rot. So I um, I found this video on YouTube how to stitch up vintage school satchels or something like that. Um, went, went and got a, uh, a needle and a proper thread, proper needle, spent three evenings sewing the thing up. She loved it. She thought it was absolutely perfect. I didn't change anything in my long-term memory. If I wanted to do that today, I'd have to go back to the video and do it again and watch it again. I just performed it once. I didn't learn how to do it. I did it brilliantly, but just once. And that's performance versus learning, because there was no change to my long-term memory. So having an idea about, about the learning process, I think is important. You've probably looked at lots of this, but Tom, Tom Sherrington and I use his walkthrough model, which comes from Willingham's um, model uh, from his book. If you've not read it, why don't students like school? The answer, in short, as to why students don't like school is because we make them think. And without making them think, they can't learn. So there's something in the environment you want them to pay attention to. It's a two-way street, they need to pay attention to it, but we have to make this stuff irresistible. They have to not, you know, just be loving it for its own sake. They have some stuff in their working memory that they know about it, three or four things, not many more than that. And then what happens is we grapple with the stuff in the learning, we build on what we already know. Thank goodness we forget stuff. You know, there's photos of me at weddings when, we were 25, when I was 25. I have no recollection of ever being here. I don't know if, you get, if you've reached that stage yet, but it's a funny stage to reach. And then, 
and then luckily we remember stuff. And what happens when we do the retrieval, we remember stuff is the, is the brain that's controlling this organism thinks, this stuff's important for this organism. It's the fourth time this organism's thought about this stuff. I'm going to save this because this organism might need this stuff in the future. That's actually what's going on in your brain. So you need to shape teaching around that model. And I didn't realize that for a long time. Right? I used to do a talk near the end of my career called 25 Years of Hurt. You know, in a 33-year career of teaching, for the first 25 years, I got by on force of character and enthusiasm, not much else. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was learning, learning by doing and by trial and error. I, I was quite a decent teacher, but I'd have been a lot better if I'd known about how children learn, right? Miles better. So I think you need to think about that. So that's the adaptive teaching, that's the understanding how brains work and how children learn. Got to make the stuff memorable. Be, you'll be careful here because in our attempt to make the stuff irresistible, we can divert people's attention rather than focus people's attention. Um, this is no word of a lie. I worked with a school and we said to the school, look, you really need to do some, something about, about challenging children. They're getting through lesson after lesson after lesson without having to think. They're never asked a question. If they, say, if they are asked a question and they say they don't know, they're never really challenged. <laughs> Went back to, <laughs> 10 weeks later. Um, the SLT said, well, we've done it. We've stuck at it. It's been really hard. We've been asking questions to, to the corners of the classroom. Um, and we've had, a, we've had an absolute tsunami of parental complaints. Parental complaints because we're asking their children questions. Uh, and I said, well, your response has to be, if you're asking me not to ask your children questions, you're really asking me not to, um, not to educate your child. They may as well be in the corridor. You may as well be in the corridor. And, I, and um, in one of the lessons, and it was a, it was a music lesson, ostinatas, like short passages of music, rhythms and beats. Every time, it was a mixed class, every time a child got a question right, and it was only boys who volunteered to answer questions, they got a loaded Nerf gun. You know what a Nerf gun is? Got a loaded Nerf gun, there was a line on the floor, there were six lollipops on the wall, and if they hit a lollipop and knocked it off the wall, they got the lollipop. I'm with the head of ITT. I'm thinking she's going to be rocking like this. She's shouting out, go for the flat one. It's got, got, got a bigger surface area. <laughs> right? True. True. Two minutes from the end, another shot from a lad. Teacher says, I think you hit that. I think my, I think my it didn't fall on the floor, but I think my, um, my boot tack's too strong. You can have that one anyway. Absolute uproar. You can imagine the lads. Or they, they left shouting, that's not fair that Jake's got that. That's not fair. I hit mine as well. I want one of those, sir. I hadn't remembered any music. But the teacher and the head of ITC thought it was great. Everybody was engaged. But they absolutely weren't. The girls hated it. The girls didn't offer one answer. The boys were just obsessed with the Nerf gun. So be, you ought to be careful about what, what attracts them to the stuff. It has to be intrinsically in its own right. Um, attractive. And then assessment. So I'm going to say a little bit more about assessment. Um, Christine Council, I have deep respect for Christine, her work. Research led Lester a couple of years ago. She said, teach them stuff, check the secure on it. If they're not, do something about it. And her response to that, uh, that, that tweet was, thanks, Steve, shortest policy document ever. Imagine all those documents you've got in schools about assessment. It's really that simple, right? Teach them some stuff. If they haven't got it, check, check they've got it. If they haven't got it, then re reteach it in another way or restructure the, resequence the curriculum till they get it. Just carry on till they get it. I mean, interviewed Dylan about assessment. I do, I do a, a webinar for Haringey, a live webinar. So first one was, was Dylan, second one was Becky Allen, both about assessment. And I think, I, I really like this. Lee, he said, Lee Cronbach said, assessment is basically a procedure for drawing conclusions give people things to do, we look at what they did, we draw conclusions. Think about it from that perspective, I think everything makes a lot more sense. What conclusions can I draw when I see the test results? I've drawn rubbish conclusions for years and years and years from data, used really badly, right? And it's all been a bit of a nonsense. And he talks about two main problems bedeviling assessment, scores not depending on things they should and scores depending on things they shouldn't. So the first one's exemplified really easily. If you do that unit, in, in year three on magnets and you do a test at the end and it's a written test and there's no practical, 
then that's the first one. Because it should, if it's, if, it's a, if it's science, it should have a bit of practical in it. But the test result doesn't depend on the practical, and it should, because that's doing the science as well. The second one's exemplified here in a beautiful question I picked up in a school in Milton Keynes. This is a year two maths question. Circle the shape with four faces. Think if you're an EAL pupil. You know what a face is? And you've got the word circle used there as a verb instead of a noun in a geometry question, for goodness sake. I asked a secondary assistant head the answer there, and she said, it's the cube. Right, so you've got four, four, there's four here. That's got four sides. That's got a circle on it. And the tetrahedron's the answer. So you can't, you can't draw any conclusions from that because it depends on literacy. You can't draw any maths conclusions about it, really, to be for, for certain. You have no idea. So your assessments need to be really good. And um, then we interviewed um, Becky, and she was talking about, about top-down policies on assessment, and I love what she says there. Um, the school assessment lead says, we've told everybody that for the end of year eight test, they should be doing multiple choice questions. You go and see what the drama department's doing, and it's completely insane. <laughs> and then when you see those top-down policies across schools, it just is, you know, there's no relation between between the content, the pedagogy, and then this top-down assessment. So, and it's really interesting about parents. I mean, she talked about this, she talked about the three things I talk about, which is the content, the response, the adaptive teaching, and the assessment. All three have to be working in concert. If you've got people working on curriculum, they can't just work on content. That's only a third of what they should be working on. If you're working on how you teach it, and how you know they've learned what you've taught them, and what you do when they don't. Are your teachers at liberty in your schools to change what they teach depending on what the in-the-moment assessment is telling them about what children have learned, about what they've taught? And if they're not doing that, then they're not adapting. And every time, every time you don't check the corners of the classroom, those usually boys who fall behind at year seven, every time you, you don't check and you carry on, you go, everybody got that yet? Can we carry on yet? Okay. And they're all there going like that. And they're cracking on, and you're leaving them further and further behind. They're the, yeah, they're the ones who are causing trouble in year 10. They're the ones who, who are absent PA in year 10. Why do you go to anywhere to be used to study all day? Because you've been left behind. Right, so it is really important from a, from a social justice point of view that we get this right. And then parents. Beck is really interesting. I would simply say your child took a test with 30 marks available, and they scored 24. The most common marks in the class were around... I'd give a range 19 to 23, that's all I would say. Right? All that data you send home is only useful if the parents know where they are, where their child is in relation to everybody else. And then ask them to have conversations about what they were tested on. When we crunch it into some central figure that everybody's got to have, everybody's got to give a grade at a certain point, then the, 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 the information we're giving parents isn't very useful. And if we don't do the context of their child, it's really difficult. I was talking to a Senko who just had a year 10 parents evening last week, and she said, I had a terrible parents evening. I've been telling these, these parents that their childs were on, target, uh, were on target, the child's doing well, they're making good progress. And then finally, after giving them no attainment data until the year 10 exams, the, they had a queue of parents saying, you told me my child was doing really well on progress, and they're on progress to get a grade one. What are you on about? You told me they were doing all right. So in an, in, a, in an attempt to protect them from the reality of what they were achieving, they kind of just euphemistically treated um, parents with contempt, really, and the children. They didn't really tell them what they were getting. There's a big issue, big issue there that I'm, I'm finding is happening in schools. So there's my three bits. A couple of things to finish this first section. I think Dieter Rams is, I say less is more. I don't believe in less, less is more anymore. I think if you do a few less of the good stuff and just continue to do the average stuff, less is less. Less but better. Do, the, do really good stuff deeper and better. I was, heard Dylan speak the other day. He was in town. I don't know if you, anybody caught him. He was in Peterborough, a few other places around the country promoting um, the work with SSAT. And someone said, oh, our school said we can't do any training because we've got no money. And his response without missing a beat was this. If you're heading into a storm, why cut the power to your boat's engines? Right, the last thing in these unbelievably crunchy times financially is to cut training. The last thing you should do is cut training. 
got to, you've got to ring fence it until you absolutely can't anymore. Um, I, I, Alex Quigley, uh, I worked, did a lot of work with. I think this is really interesting. When he and Rob Coe were uh, Huntington and Chem, respectively, they were very purist about what we did in classrooms. Now they are at the centre, at the EF, trying to implement things nationally. They're very, <laughs> they're very clear how bloody hard it is to change anybody doing anything. Make anybody change doing anything. It's so difficult. Um, and Alex's mantra, I think, is good. If the change in practice is hard to implement for teachers, there's something wrong with the, with the intended change. Um, I love this from Alan Bennett. I found this, when I went into my wife's um, classroom the other day, this is what I found. He was on the Leeds City Art Gallery. He said this, like most public institutions today, the gallery is required not merely to do its job, but also to prove it's doing its job. It's an exercise at the same time, self-defeating and self-fulfilling. The current orthodoxy assumes that public servants will only do their job as well as they can if they are required to prove that they are doing their job as well as they can. But this proving takes time, and the time spent preparing annual reports and corporate plans showing one is doing the job is taken out of the time one could otherwise spend doing the job, thus ensuring that the institution is indeed less efficient than would otherwise be the case. And every public institution now is involved in this futile, time-wasting merry-go-round. I rewrote it for schools if you want it. In 2013, I told our governing body that they didn't really need the CEF in its full form. We'd just do a one-page summary for meetings. So they said, that's a great idea. So we chucked away the CEF, and I just had a one-page summary, and they never knew. They never knew that there wasn't a CEF behind the summary. Right? And in 2017, we were inspected to be awarded an outstanding grading. And I gave John, Sir John Townsley one side of A4 as our CEF. That's all it was. I didn't waste any time on that stuff. I reckon you could chuck away... 95% of performance management paperwork, 95% of SDPs, and no child would notice. Because of that, you know, opportunity costs is the biggest, biggest concept, the most important concept for any of our teachers, any of our lives. If I'm asking, I, I got obsessed with this in the last decade. For the last decade, I asked two questions. First question was, is what I'm asking people to do going to improve the quality of teaching learning curriculum? If it was, I asked the second question. Okay, if it is, is there something else I could ask them to do that would be even better? And if there was, they did that. Because you can only spend an hour once. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a truism we need to think about sometimes. So, I have a question for you for two minutes while I get a drink of water. Reflecting on your processes, what do you ask subject phase leads to do that takes them time, which could be better spent developing the curriculum? I'll give you two minutes. I'll take responses from two people. Off you go. <laughs> Colleague here, your name is? Bill. Bill, Bill, what were you thinking on your table? Um, a little bit controversial. We, we, we were thinking that we think the sector's got a bit better at reducing inefficient focus on goal in a top down way, but some of that still is generated by teachers and middle leaders themselves. And actually, we've got to actually be quite directive to say, no, no, we, we don't need that. In fact, don't do it. I mean, someone I went into a school and they said, well, look, we've nailed, after what you said last time, we've nailed whole class feedback. Good, I'm really glad. Went into the class and what they'd done was create a sheet for the class with every, every child's name down the side and a comment for each child. I said, you might as well write it in the bloody book. Right? <laughs> you, you, they just couldn't wean themselves off it. You, you're so right. So actually, when leaders give them liberty to not do stuff, they'll still do it. It's so ingrained. But, but, but it's also a leadership level. I remember saying to um, Richard Sheriff, Richard Sheriff used to be president of our school, came, you know, we, we were talking just before lockdown. He wanted me to, as a research school, to support their teaching school hub thing. And I, and I just said, we only have one objective for performance management, that's become a better teacher. We don't do, any, we don't do the three, you don't do the whole school subject, individual, just one. Become a better teacher and we'll help you do it. He said, but you've got to have three. I said, Richard, we only have one and no one's dying. It's all right. <laughs> Of course. It's just, you know, it's just complete sense. We don't need three. So thank you, yeah. So giving liberty for people and, and, and giving them permission is really important. Um, a colleague here, what were you thinking on your table? Just be really good to have a, just look again through that lens of 
do we really need to do this and what impact does it have? I just put them up there, you know, thoughts to, to, just to get you thinking really. So let me, let me carry on because I want to talk about succession planning and this is, I'm going to whiz through this. But succession planning was always on my list of things to do, never did it. Right, until around 2016, I thought this is getting a bit crunchier now. I think I can see some issues around um, recruitment, so we really need to get, get going. Nothing like it is now. Right? <laughs> you know, I, talking to heads now, and I imagine it's the same for you, the single most important thing is, is recruitment and retention. And, and, and it really came to a head with me when we lost the head of English and there was a, a, I didn't realise, that I, I didn't anticipate them going. And I thought, well, I must do something about this finally. I must get it, because it, it never got to the top of my to-do pile. It's always something that was on there, but I never quite got there. Um, so it's, a lot of it's in, in the book, Putting Stuff First. And it's when in 2010, Alex and I realised that we should, um, that the only thing we should work on is, is, in, is improving the quality of teaching. And it's, it's what Mark Rowland says, focus on what's in the school's gift, otherwise you're not chasing the wind. The one thing we can sort out is the quality of teaching and learning, right? That's the one thing we can have massive influence on. So this, that's, the, that's the philosophy behind putting staff first. A happy, healthy, motivated, highly trained expert staff who turn up day in, day out is the one thing that's most likely to help pupils make good progress in their learning. So then schools should put staff first. We know that great teaching is the only thing which will make a school truly great. It's that simple and that complex, right? I know how complex that is. Um, but Johnny Otley, so Johnny was our head of sick form who, who co-wrote the book with me. Um, runs a really good trust over in the East Riding. His trust single, you know, the strategy for the whole trust is a good teacher in front of every class. That's it. That's all they do. That's all they focus on. That's the single driving force for them. Um, and it works. So succession planning, that's a great book if you've not read it, Leadership Bullshit by Pfeffer. Really helps you stop doing some silly stuff. Um, 73% of companies have decided that lying to their employees about their potential to advance is the right choice. I imagine, I imagine that's, that's grown in, in the education system at the moment because hanging on to good people is really, really, really hard, um, but wrong. So I, I used, I wanted to do it, I used, I'm a big fan of using business practices in schools. So this paper by Deloitte is really good and I'll give you all the slides. I'll also give you, if you want them, all the PDFs of the individual chapters of our, our books, you can have all those, primary and secondary. I can't give you the SEND ones yet because it's only just been published, but you can have the others. Um, and when you're going to do succession planning conversations, you need really good data, you need really good training conversations, so you need good measures and good training. Right? You need good, good tools for having those conversations if you're going to have proper conversations with people about succession planning. Um, these are the hurdles. You know, always busy, aren't we? You know, I know how, how tough that is. It's really unsettling when you're talking to someone who wants your job. Right? That's true. That happens. It um, can always be really subjective. And you can have, you'd have, you've known one thing about this, this member of staff that's stuck in your head. And if you're really biased and awful and subjective, that can colour how you think about them. Um, the whole process, if it's not done transparently, can be really unhelpful, can be actually worse than not doing anything when you look at succession planning. Um, the people that you're developing in your institution have to own it. And there's this funny thing about teaching and leadership. Right? Most of us who have become head teachers, the, the germ of that journey towards headship will be because we've been good teachers in the classroom um, as main scale teachers. Right? And, and that balance between teaching and leadership is a tricky one to get right. Um, these are hurdles. This is how you overcome them. You get really good training to have conversations. You have really good information about, about the, the development work you want to offer. You have to be genuine. You have to show commitment. That has to be genuine. You can't fake that. If you can have a conversation with someone about the rest of their career, on the next stage of their career, you've got to be genuinely interested in it and genuinely want to help them. Um, they have to own it. It helps massively with retention, the system we set up at Huntington. Um, and it deepens that commitment to the institution because they think they buy into the fact that you're trying to help them. So you need to know why. This is why we did it. We, were, we wanted to have an overview of who we might lose. My, my mate is a, in his, what a retirement job my mate. My mate was head of PE down in Hove Park and I taught down in Sussex. Um, and he worked out by hook or by crook that David Gill at Man United um, was someone he played football with in 1975 at Birmingham Uni. So he became, he's now a first, my mate, and his, his retirement job is a first team scout for Man United. And when he goes to the meetings in August, 
they put up the team they want in three years' time. Right? From, from all, the, all the teams around the world, all the players around the world, our ideal team would be this. And they, these would be the second players in those positions and the third players in those positions. So those football teams are doing that three years hence. So it's the kind of stuff that I think we should be doing in our institutions. Um, I think personalised CPD was the last bit of the jigsaw for CPD for us that really helped um, the kind of personalised bit. And then I think that's true. If you can become renowned for really good development work um, and, and really interested in developing people, you attract good people to you. We, we certainly found that. Um, I think you have to be really well trained and systematic. It has to be systematic. Um, weave it into the school systems, not a bolt-on. Uh, I think that sounds wrong, but it, it turned out to be right, counterintuitively. Um, I think we have to help them. I, it, Fulham's line that the best measure of leadership is the leadership you develop in others. I think it's true. And then, I don't know if you agree with that anymore. I think it's so tight out there now um, to find, you know, and I think Sam, Sam was giving you some quite dark data about recruitment, wasn't he, earlier? Um, but I think that's true. We, every time we lost someone, we gained another good person because of the repute of the school. So I wrote that in one of my books, you must all have a plan for what we do beyond our current role. We can have several new stages of our lives and careers and having a plan for the future makes the present feel more precious and less demanding. If Trout and Salmon magazine gave me a column, I'd be gone tomorrow. I wouldn't be doing any of this stuff. But they won't. I keep asking them to. Um, but I wrote, at least I got a book of fishing published amongst my nine. Um, John Cat were very kind. Um, last time I got, uh, my, my last royalties for that book was £1.28 in six months. I think I bought that copy. <laughs> so we got, we got Network Rail in. We got one of their head HR people into school. And they had to set up this, this uh, leadership capacity model. They had sociability thinking and aspiration on theirs. We took out resilience because resilience was in aspiration for them. We put it in as our own because I think you have to be really resilient in education in, in, at every level. And then we also put knowledge. So we had, they had star, we added R, which could be rats or star, depending on which way you looked at it, and then we added knowledge. So we had our stark capacities, our stark um, attributes. And you won't be able to see them from the back, but you'll see them on the screen. You'll see them when you get the, when you get the slides. Um, and in September, one of the things we did back in 2012 was bring all performance management, as we call it performance development, into the SLT. So I used to line manage 30 people. So if I wasn't um, teaching myself, I'd be helping other people get better at teaching. That's, I saw that as my job. I, did, you know, I, had, I had an HR person to under, understand HR. I didn't go into education um, to know employment law. Um, so I, I just worked on the stuff that was really great. And when you had the conversation in September reviewing their performance for the year, for the first half an hour you do the review, second half an hour, they would come along with this self-reflection tool. And there's 15 attributes, and they would just really scribble intuitively an example in the right-hand side. I said, don't spend it very long about it, but just, I want you to just at least have thought about them before you come to the meeting. Then we'd have the meeting. Um, we, had the, we, 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 we were trained really well. I'll show you how we, we, we were trained by a woman from M&S. Um, who did this stuff you know, really professionally. That was really helpful. And then, then they'd had that conversation. We'd look at the start model. We'd have their performance and their, and their, and their leadership capacity. And then we used a nine-box model. I don't know if anybody's used a nine-box model, but it's really, really helpful. It's, a, it's an industry thing. Um, usually, capacity for leadership is on the y-axis and performance is on the x-axis. But we turned them around the other way for this reason. Because they, there are nine types of person, nine types of, 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 of descriptor. And the expert performance, person who, who's not that interested in leadership, but just, you know, we all need primary and secondary people who are interested in going up the greasy pole, but just teach really good lessons day in, day out. We need loads of those, right? So if, the, if leadership capacity had been on the y-axis and performance on the x-axis, they'd have been down here which didn't feel right graphically. Just visually, it put them in the wrong spot. I wanted to privilege those people. So, um, probably my, the, the, the acme of my, of my ability at PowerPoint was to get the colours 
going from gray to red. Uh, that took a lot of thinking about. But the red is flight risk, right? You can see people who are strong performers at their peak or rising are at flight risk. Those are the people that we should be worried about. And um, each, each descriptor has a description of current performance. So good is good performance in current roles, shows some capacity for further leadership roles, and then what you might do to help them develop their Stark attributes, which is focus on strengthening performance whilst exploring how to develop specific Stark characteristics through appropriate development opportunities. And I'll talk about development opportunities in a second. Um, and then key to that is that they choose where they are on that box, not you. Right? And, and people ask me, I bet they, you know, I bet they over-egg themselves. No, they under-egg themselves. Teachers are intuitively kind of modest about stuff. So what it allowed you to do was we, we, we were very transparent about it. We put all the, all the information into a spreadsheet and then you could, you could, you could have a record of where, the, where they were in the nine box position. Were they interested in career development? What would they like to develop? Were they a flight risk? And some comments. So some really nice comments. Um, Nothing at the moment, but she's keen to look at something if the perfect thing came up, but she's a no-but in terms of development. Um, further wants to develop further approaches to behaviour management, enjoying the job and the external work at the university, no aspiration for leadership, potential interest in research school projects related to teaching and learning. So you suddenly had, in the, a whole, you know, we had 112 teachers, a whole view of teachers' aspirations for your, for your school. And then what you could do with, if you tweet the Excel spreadsheet, you can look at each department. So this is the Latin department. This is the analysis of the Latin department. It's actually science. Okay, but um, I didn't, you know, it, it gives you a really good view of, of a few things. So the first thing is there's no potential internal success for, for subject leader of Latin. You can see that at a glance. Because we knew that these two people, the strong performer, the riser, were both not ASLs. They weren't assistant subject leaders. Because they were in this bunch. The second thing on there, you'd got two flight risks. And the third was, not enough great performers. Too many who are stuck in that middle rung. So those are the three things you can get from just tweaking the Excel spreadsheet. Gold dust information for HR, gold dust information for leaders in schools about how to, where the weaknesses are in their, in their profile of their, um, of their staffing. So we used to promote the opportunities. I'll tell you about the opportunities in a second. We promote the opportunities in June, do the meetings in September. The Stark activities would be from January to June. They'd be developing something on their own for themselves in that period that kept them out their nose out of the TES. Right? Just when they might be thinking about being a bit bored and looking for somewhere else, they'd got something to get their teeth into. Um, and then you'd, you'd get the cycle going around again. So we had, it's a bit out of date now because you know, 2020 was, COVID smashed into us and then I left at um, July 21. But every, we had opportunities for every, every stage of, of your career. Um, that's a page of, of the, you know, all under the start qualities. So development opportunities and a reading list. Um, that's the kind of stuff you did if you were an ECT or an ECT2. Attend a session called the Introduction to Research School. Um, attend a recent school twilight, observe an expert teacher within your department, just things that would be thinking, yeah, I'm developing myself and school is supporting me. Um, there's the reading list, expert teacher, just all these different stuff. And, you know, they did a few things for everybody. Steve Mumby came in. I did something on blogging. I did something on applications and interviews. And it's extraordinarily successful. Now, implementation... I use, I'm a big fan of the EEF's implementation guide, um, but I still think it's too complex. If you've used it, I still think it's too messy. I have a very simple way of, of writing an implementation plan. So you sort out your development issue. And for us, it was having better conversations, um, really well-trained conversations about succession planning. You go from step one to step two, which is at the end. That's the next, you, you, you decide what you want which is you know, a uni universally agreed model for succession planning conversations where we're really well trained and know what to do when you get difficult conversations and moments that you feel uncomfortable about. Um, 
That is the change. We want really good ones rather than idiosyncratic ones that depend on each character. You know, universally good, consistent ones. Um, we got the woman in from M&S to help us, and we actually did a training video that was absolutely brilliant. Two of our colleagues ran one of these conversations and, and, and filmed it. Um, and then the outcome is really confident people who can have really good conversations about succession planning and really develop our staff. So I'm happy to take, if, if you want one minute on your table to discuss that, I'm happy to take questions before I just finish off with a final thing. I can send you all that stuff. If you want any of those documents, the spreadsheets, let me know. I imagine, because there's so many different models now in education, I imagine in a big mat, you'll have HR who do all this. Um, but even if you're in a big mat and you kind of think, oh, that actually looks quite nice, anything I can pass on, you can have. So I'll give you one minute and I'll finish off. Okay, I'm going to finish off with um, just 15 minutes on SEND Her, because I think um, another one of our priorities in schools is special educational needs and disabilities. Um, for the book, we interviewed, we begin the book with an interview with Harry and Bell. That's, that's not their names. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a parent, and the parent's called Bell, and it's Harry. Harry was the child. Um, Harry, which I'll talk about a bit later. Then we, we interviewed some real experts. Really lovely to interview Ben Newmark and got Tom Reese to write the intro to the book. Um, then we interviewed some people in special schools and then mainstream and then the irrepressible Shelley Moore from British Columbia um, in Canada to finish the book off. So we interviewed Harry and Belle. Um, Harry, Harry's got autism. He's on the autism spectrum, got ADHD. He was in the year five and he was so troubled and so challenging that halfway through year five, the, t the, the, the class teacher had got him at the back of the class, facing with his back to the class, looking out the window while she taught everybody else all day. Um, and mum removed him. The school was actually closed down after that. Not because of that, but it was closed down when it was inspected. It was a shocking, shocking, before, shocking situation. So he's really happy where he is now, and we had a lovely conversation with him. His mum just talked about communication. Um, and another thing that came up, another thing that I say now that came up in these conversations is that someone said, all I do as a head is think, when I'm talking to a child, imagine having their parents standing behind them. It was such a great thing. I wish I'd had that. I wish I'd thought of that when I barked at one or two children I shouldn't have barked at in my, in my career. We've all done it when you go, uh, just imagine their parents standing behind them. I think it's a, it's a really good check on, on, on adult behavior. Um, but it was really lovely, really, really good. Um, and then, then Harry, I said, come on, Harry, what's your favourite subject? And it was a crazy conversation on Zoom. You know, we had a dog flying around, Harry in and out the picture, mum talking to us. Um, he said, I love science, I love it. I said, well, tell me about science. He said, well, I don't, I don't do any writing, um, but I do lots of experiments. And my favourite experiment was, was with seeds, and we were trying to work out what you need for seeds. They don't grow, they don't grow in cupboards, but they need light, and they need warmth, and they need water. I said, okay, Harry, so I said, which, which, is the, which is the most important one? He said, oh, that's a really good question. And he really toyed around with it. He could ver just verbalised all his thinking. And he said, no, in the end, they, you need them both. They don't grow without, you need both of them. So well, thanks for that, Harry. And at, at one point, he'd said about how much he likes hard work. So Mary said to him, tell me a little bit more about hard. So this is what he said. I like hard because it's learning. Because if it's easy, you're not really learning because you can just do it. But when it is hard, you are thinking so it stays in your head. It's a bit like Dan Willingham had said, Harry, just say this for me. Right? And Mary went, oh, oh, Harry, I think every teacher needs to hear that. It's abs it was you know, from the mouth of babes. Oh, my goodness. Um, then we spoke to Ben Newmark. Ben has a daughter, if you didn't know, called Bessie, um, who has Williams syndrome, which is a learning disability. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know about it, and it was really interesting. And this is what he said, and this, this really, really resonated with me. Um, he said, I wouldn't want Bessie not to have a learning disability. If you change that about her, she would no longer be the same person. She wouldn't be Bessie because the part of her which has a learning disability is also the part of her which is everything else. I would never got that. As a, you know, I've got two boys, oh, and they've got their, they've got their failings, but um, you know, I never had that sense. Of, of what Ben said. He said it's really hard 
for people who don't have children with a learning disability to, under, to understand that. And one of the ideas I'd had, I've got a colleague, I've got a, we got really close friends, and they had a child late. Um, and we, we go on holiday with them, and uh, the, the girl is now, let's call her Jane, is now 17. Um, she was born with Down syndrome. And severe Down syndrome, one of those cases where you have to have the operation after six weeks to turn the heart back because it's back to front, etc. And she's now 17. And um, dad is a professor of English, mum's a lawyer. And uh, mum gave up being a lawyer to be a TA. And I thought it would be a great idea to interview our friend um, about her experience of, of being a TA and having a Down syndrome child. And halfway through the interview, Mary said, is there anything, she said to our friend, is there anything that's good about your child, Jane? Because it was such a terrible interview. And what was, what was fascinating, I told this, and, and, I, and I, we got it transcribed, I, I wrote up the, edited the, the, the interview, sent it off to our friend, and she hung on to it for a week. And she emailed me back and said, you can't, you can't post this, you can't use this. I didn't realise how angry I was. And it's all in there. Um, and I, and I did this talk a couple of weeks ago down in Southampton. Um, I've already done this talk. It's only the third time I've done this talk. And, and a woman came up to me at the end. She said, like, my, my son was down, was, was, is, is autistic. Um, and what you have to do is mourn for the child that you didn't have. And once you've done that, you can love the child you've got. And what we realised when we had our interview with our friend was that actually all that mourning was done in that hour hour and a half of interview because she hadn't done it. Um, and the one thing she talked about that actually stuck with her for her whole life, um, for the for 17 years, was that, you know, as she would have done, within weeks she joined the Down Syndrome Society, got the first copy of their six monthly newsletter. And on the front were five girls in uniform, beautiful secondary uniform, and one in the middle had got Down Syndrome. She said, I looked at that, that image and I thought, it's okay. Oh, Jane's going to be okay. She will go to secondary school like everybody else. And of course she didn't. You know, she said five years of primary, I'd go and pick her up. Uh, you know, I'd finish my class, go around the corner, find her, and, and the teacher would go, well, she had a good morning. <laughs> you know, she bit these three people this afternoon. Um, and it was only till now, till she's 17 and in, in FE, where she's actually got a curriculum that's fit for her, that listens to her needs at the centre of it, is she happy? Um, but it's a, it was a real, it was a real learning moment for me. So we never used that interview. There's four interviews we didn't use. People found it really hard to think about. Um, ben also said this, and I think this is, there's something in this. He said, we find it really hard to envisage dignified, broader measures to celebrate all types of human achievement. I think that's true. He said, when I got Bess's first report home, um, it had on the data, emerging, 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 emerging. You know all that euphemistic nonsense we use? Um, and he said, I know she is. She's got Williams syndrome. That's the point. She'll never make that gap up. We talk about closing gaps. But she's never going to close the gap because right? she's got Williams syndrome. Let's celebrate what she is. She, he said the second page of the report was great because they knew her to a T. They could describe, they knew exactly what she's like and what she needs to do. But that data doesn't help. And we chase that data you know, relentlessly. I, I don't think we should go back to records of achievement, you, you know, remember the horrors of those um, in the 90s, um, and, the, and those, those wine, wine list things we had. But nice thing to start thinking, uh, an interesting provocation from Ben. And then we, we interviewed Margaret Mulholland, and she was great, she said, um, uh, Dylan Williams, her educational hero. Uh, she said, adaptive teaching is very dependent on formative assessment, short cycle formative assessment, which informs your next step, giving you the knowledge of the child's learning for you to be able to be adaptive. My blog that I've, I've posted today is all about that, um, all about how do now tasks at the beginning of lessons have, been white no have become white noise to teachers and to pupils. They don't think about them. They just think, well, I've got to do some retrieval. Let's do an MCQs and they don't react to, to the outcomes of what the MCQs are telling, they just crack on with the lesson afterwards and just become procedural white noise. Um, maybe worth, oh, just, it's just out there as a provocation. But that's, that's really interesting. Let me tell you some people in, in SEND, huh? Um, Dave Whitaker, who runs, um, a, 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 is the head of, head of teaching and learning in a trust of specialist schools up in, the, up in Yorkshire. Um, 
And I, I was blobbing a lot in these interviews, right? So I'd be going, oh, that's just so amazing. Oh, I believe you're doing that work. And Mary would say, John, shut up. They're just doing their work. Especially specialist, specialist heads. Oh, my goodness. They're amazing. But I think they just don't care about anybody. They just are so focused on the needs of these children with extreme additional needs. They have a flying whatever about what any, anybody external thinks. They know what they're doing. They're amazing. And, and, and Dave said this, our values relating to SCND curriculum provision are aligned across the trust. We have leaders who put their necks on the line with the curriculum to make sure what is appropriate for children with additional needs. Right? That, they, they, it, I think it's much harder. If I had 30 year 10 teaching Romeo and Juliet at GCSE with four children with additional needs, I think that's trickier than a class of eight with severe learning needs and disabilities that but you've got five adults in and you can do eight different curricula with. And that's, that's, in a way, your task is more straightforward than making sure everybody in the room comes with you with adaptive teaching. Um, and then, you know, I feel Ros and Phil, I never, never realised that you can be ahead of a special school and you just know the children aren't going to make it to 16, that they're life limited, hadn't crossed my mind. And this is what they said. We had to say goodbye to a 14-year-old who had complex healthcare needs. At his funeral, his father was celebratory when he spoke about his son. He celebrated his son's uniqueness. He didn't want to change his son. He accepted his firstborn with love and wanted everyone to understand that he brought a very different gift into their life. Oh, my goodness. And we've probably all, in one way or another, lost a child as a head teacher. But to know that was going to happen several times in your career as a head, because it's part of, the, part of being head of that school, it's extraordinary. Um, and then there's Helen Ralston, who's now head at, um, at uh, she's now head at uh, the Langley Girl for Schools down in South East London. But when we interviewed her a few weeks ago, she was head of, a, of an, autistic, an autism unit on, attached to a mainstream school. Gosh, she was ambitious. And people might love dinosaurs and write beautifully about them, but that's not the national curriculum. They can explore their special interests, but we don't design every lesson around special interests. If you want standardised outcomes at the end of year 11, you need to be following something that is based on the national curriculum. Extraordinary results for her children with autism. Extraordinary. And the ambition was so clear for all these, everybody we spoke to, unbelievably ambitious for these children. And then mainstream, Tanisha Pascoe Matthews is a um, SNCO in, in South London. Um, she has two, two autistic children herself, her, who didn't speak for a long time. So her, her son Jaden didn't speak till he was eight. And he spoke when they bought him a speaking train. And he conversed with the train. It's the first time he'd spoken. Extraordinary. And there's a book by her about that experience, a lovely, lovely picture book about it. And she says this, I think the curriculum should be ambitious. I think students should be able to access the curriculum. Many SEN students simply collide with the curriculum. What a great phrase that is. They just bounce off it. And they bounce off it because they haven't got the resources necessary to gain that access. Then they've got the cognitive skills. They're not taught in enough precision and commitment about how to access this stuff. They just bounce off it. They collide with the curriculum. Gary Orbin, great co-head, he said this. It's worth touching on the evidence for what... He, he's also the EEF's content specialist for SEND. Um, what works best for people with SEND? It can be best described as an automatic doors approach. If there are things teachers can do that are useful for all pupils, then well, being particularly useful for some like automated doors in the shop. If you go, if it's cold in the winter and at the doors are MS, MS open, you don't have to get your hands out of your pockets. That's useful. If I've got bags... If we're shopping, that's even more useful. If I'm in a wheelchair, it's essential. But it helps us all. And that's a, a concept I just want to hang on to. And Rachel Rossiter, I, I, I did the crazy thing of saying to Rachel, tell me about your SND department. And she kind of bit my head off. And she said, we don't have an SND department. That, yeah, she has no TAs. Right? I spent three and a half million quid on TAs as a head in 14 years at Huntington. For what? Her job was to make sure every teacher could teach every child. That was her job. She didn't need TAs, because she upskilled her teachers. And then Shelley Moore. Shelley Moore, um, if, you, if you've got five minutes this weekend, go and find Shelley Moore's um, 
710 split video. It's a great video and explains how her thinking about, um, about SEND. She's a, uh, an SEND specialist. In, in British Columbia, they have complete inclusion, complete inclusion. So children in wheelchairs with the, the most extreme needs are in mainstream classes with everybody else and with no TA, no TA glued to them, no Velcro TA. And um, there are five, she has five principles. Presume competence. If there's one message that came through this book, and every conversation is get away from the deficit model of looking at um, uh, children with special educational needs and stop conflating lack of, uh, of additional needs with low, 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 low attainment. Stop that, 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 whole, that whole conflation of those two things. So presume competence, make sure they attend. Don't just have them on roll, go and get them into school. Put them next to each other, next to their peers. Have some core competency goals so they at least have got some model for attainment and then plan for everyone. And when I do these interviews, and when I do these interviews, whenever someone says that, I say, look, just tell me what that looks like for real. I'm not interested in, in these, these words. They're all words. Tell me what that's like. So she said, um, well, the best example I've got, I've nearly finished, by the way, best example I've got is, um, is this, this year 10 class. You had a child in there, Jake, um, who autistic, didn't, write, didn't speak, didn't write, communicated by pictures only. And the teacher said, I want to teach writing memoir. And, and Shelley said, well, let's have a think about it. What can he do? He can see, he can smell, he can taste, he can hear. Um, and they created a sensory pathway through the classroom of all the smells and sights and sounds of Christmas. Because he wanted to do a piece of writing about Christmas from 10 years ago when they were five years old. So you had ch all the children went through it and loved it and go, oh, I remember that, I remember this, I love that smell, that's so-and-so, oh, I remember this. So they all wrote much better and Jake could do his pictures and communicate what he was thinking about it. And it was, uh, it, I, I wasn't convinced, I'm still not completely convinced about you know, total inclusion, um, but it, made me, it shifted, my, shifted me quite a bit when you heard her speak, and, you know, and the, her, her videos are amazing and very entertaining. So, a few things we said, you know, the first insight is a paradox, that it's both simple and complex. Every child with additional needs um, can do something, but also they need specific help. It's really tricky. It's tricky. But lovely, lovely message there from Mary. Uh, there's a problematic term. Don't use the term special in Scotland or Wales. When we spoke to Barney Anglis, they don't use it in, in, in Scotland or Wales. Uh, and, and, you know, you know when you talk to someone who's a real expert, like uh, we spoke to Anita Devi. Oh, my goodness, she knows everything there is to know about SEND. And you've got, the trouble is you've got with SEND two separate constructs under different legislation. And you, everybody's in it together under one umbrella. And Stephen Shaw says that. If you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Right. They're all different. It's all with, you know, and, and, and to have them under one umbrella is really problematic. Um, that's true. I've tried to learn how to, how to read music for years. That's, you know, that's Gary Orbin. And I, I'll finish with two slides. One on Bart Simpson. I, do you remember Bart when he was on the special needs table? And he says this, let me get this straight. We're behind the rest of our class and we're going to catch up with them by going slower than they are. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's true. It's what happens all the time. And then uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as someone who doesn't, I, I work, but I, I don't, I'm not a head teacher anymore. I, I get to do things like go to spend a week, I spent a week in a, in a convent with this woman. Um, Claire Keegan wrote a book called... Um, Small things like these, quite an extraordinary novel. And uh, she runs write, re, occasionally runs writing courses. So south of Dublin there's a convent in Tullock, and I went there with 30 other people, 29 other people, and we were in a class, and she turns up at the front of the class on the first morning to lecture about how to write the short story. She didn't say hello or anything. She said, this is a class for grown-ups. If you don't like it and want to go down the pub, I don't care. Well, it's, like, it's just really refreshing to be in a, to be in a classroom. Like, she's kind of scary, but great. So she lectured from nine to five every day and then was, was with us for food, 
The nuns cooked all the food fresh. It's unbelievable, unbelievable week. Um, and she had Q&As in the evening. And she talked about Chekhov. Now, Chekhov says you've got to write about your characters coolly. You're not subjective about them. You don't dictate about them. You just show them. You just observe them. And she said the French for to, to look is to regard, is to have regard for your characters. And I love that. So I wrote this in the book. The French for looking is regard, eh? to have regard for what you're looking at. So not only are you observing your pupils and noticing them, you're also having regard for them. It's about looking at your pupils with proper regard. I think it's a lovely, nuanced, etymological notion that helps us both observe pupils, but also have respect for them. And there's something that came through this book is about humanity we need to have for children with additional needs. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>